Thank you, Gary, for those very uh, kind words. Um, I'm really honored, actually, to be here. Uh, special thank you to Greg and, and the CrossFit team for inviting me out here to speak to you guys. Um, the Wikipedia page is interesting, and uh, I didn't expect Gary to actually read it out uh, today. <laughs> Uh, although he did, I thought when he asked for permission, um, it was just kidding. But um, hopefully you'll get a gist of what the, whether the accuracy of that Wikipedia page uh, uh, on, on my kind of bio from my talk today, because I do cover a lot of these areas and issues. Uh, first and foremost, as Gary said, I'm a, a cardiologist. I qualified in 2001 from Edinburgh. Um, for me, this journey is really just about doing the right thing by my patient. That's it. It's my duty, my responsibility. And everything I do, I always think about that patient in front of me and uh, the wider determinants of health. And um, I've, I've done many different things as well as being a cardiologist and being an activist. I try and influence government policy as well as, as public health advocacy. I do a lot of private advocacy as well. So I'll go through some of those, that journey with you in the next hour or so, and hopefully we'll have some time for questions afterwards. But I want to start with... Um, something called the Seven Nolan Principles. So in 1995, the then Prime Minister John Major set up a, um, uh, he, he set up a committee called the Standards, uh, Committee for Standards in Public Life. And they it was after uh, a controversy that occurred in the UK where um, two members of parliament were found to be taking money from a lobbyist on behalf of Mohammed Al-Fayed to ask questions in parliament. And this was covered by the Guardian newspaper. An investigation um, ensued. In fact, actually, probably the trigger for the bringing down of the government at that stage. And then Tony Blair became prime minister shortly afterwards. But the committee that um, made, did the review actually um, concluded that there were certain standards in public life that people who deliver um, public services or people who have a duty to the public should adhere to. And I'm also a trustee of a health think tank called the King's Fund. And when I became a trustee, I was reminded of these principles, although I'd like to think that I, and I hope, most of my colleagues and doctors adhere to these principles. But it wasn't just for med medical doctors. It's for people who are, who are teachers, police officers, and politicians, those who, whose duty is to serve the public. So those seven principles are selflessness, objectivity, integrity, accountability, honesty, openness, and leadership. I think all of us would like to believe and hope that the people that serve us, whether they're politicians or doctors, adhere to these. But I think we all have to look in the mirror and think about, actually, are we adhering to these principles when we go about our day-to-day -day practice? And I must ask, I mean, how, how many of those principles do you think Donald Trump adheres to? The second thing I want to mention is, and this is part of my personal um, you know, advocate, part of what I do with my advocacy role, is also what is my role as a doctor? Is it just to my individual patient, or is it to the wider community? And I think we're missing a trick in the medical profession by not thinking about what goes on before the patient gets into the consultation room. Because actually, m much of the determinants of their health is way before they get to us. And Rudolf Virchow is considered one of the greatest physicians in the history of medicine. He was considered the father of modern pathology. He coined the term leukemia, thrombosis. And he said that actually medicine is a social science, and politics is nothing else but medicine on a large scale. The physicians are the natural attorneys of the poor, and social problems fall to a large extent within their jurisdiction. So currently, we're facing a major health crisis, um, certainly in the Western world definitely in developing countries, the UK, the US. You know, we have a major healthcare system failure, and the question is why. And Gerd Gigerenza, the director of health literacy in Berlin, Max Planck Institute, and Muir Gray um, actually talk about the seven sins that contribute to inefficient healthcare because of lack of knowledge, because of misinformed doctors, and misinformed and unwittingly harmed patients. And those seven sins are biased funding of research. So research is funded because it's likely to be profitable, not beneficial for patients bias reporting in medical journals, bias patient pamphlets, bias reporting in the media, commercial conflicts of interest, defensive medicine, and last but not least, medical curricula that fail to teach doctors how to comprehend and communicate health statistics. 
So I think this is one of the slides that can kind of help us understand why we have the problems we face in today's modern healthcare system and why there is such a huge burden of increasing chronic disease that's not being addressed properly. I think this is, for me, the, the most important slide of my talk. This is the evidence-based medicine triad published in the BMJ in 1996 by Professor David Sackett, a Canadian epidemiologist now passed away. And for me, I think this explains a lot of the problems we have. So as doctors, obviously, we want to improve our patient outcomes. Sorry, this is not... In the, you can see that in the middle, it doesn't work, it's fine. And we use our individual clinical expertise, our experience over many years as physicians, the best available evidence, and last but not least, taking into consideration individual patient values and preferences. So if you accept that concept as being, you know, true, and I think it's a, it's a it, I don't think it's overly simplistic, and then acknowledge for a second that if the best available evidence is biased or corrupted, and you're not actually taking into consideration patient values and expectations, you're going to get bad outcomes on your patients, and that was, that's what we've got. And as, this is a separate talk, but just to put things in perspective, certainly best available clinical evidence, according to uh, Richard Horton, editor of The Lancet, um, more than half of the published literature may be completely false. John Ioannidis, professor of medicine and statistics at Stanford, his own analysis, and I, I describe this man as probably being like the Stephen Hawking of medicine in terms of his academic prowess and his scientific integrity. His own calculation suggests that 93% of all medical journal publications are neither high quality in terms of the reliability, nor are they relevant to patients. So if you're making clinical decisions on biased information, you're going to get bad outcomes, and it's also unethical, especially if you know about it. What else did David Sackett say? He said, half of what you learn in medical school will turn out to be either outdated or dead wrong within five years of your graduation. The trouble is nobody can tell you which half, so you have to learn to learn on your own. Let's start with a case study. I think um, especially many of the CrossFitters here are going to enjoy this particular case study. So this is a patient that came to see me uh, a few years ago. His background is, uh, he was, uh, his name's Tony Royal, he's a 55-year-old international airline pilot with Virgin Atlantic. Very active, um, you know, he was doing triathlons and marathons, that kind of thing. But he'd followed the conventional dietary advice, followed a low-fat, high-carb diet. He said to me it wasn't a particularly high junk food diet, it seemed, but, you know, he was, he was kind of high-carb, a lot of starch. Um, BMI 28, overweight, increased waist circumference. And then he has a routine check in 2014 and his uh, total cholesterol to HDL ratio comes back at 5.3. Ideally, it should be less than 4, even better if it's less than 3. His, uh, his total cholesterol is 247. Not great. Um, and then he gets a 10-year risk assessment for having a heart attack or stroke, which comes at 12.86%, according to risk calculators that we use in conventional practice. And... Just actually, I'll, I'll, I'll ask the physicians here this question. I, in, this, in this country, I think you're cut off. I think you prescribe statins if it's over 10%. Is that right? Okay. So we'll, we'll come on to that in a, little, in a little while. Now, unfortunately, Tony suffers a heart attack a few months later. Luckily, not when he was flying a jet. Um, he got off the plane. He's experienced a bit of chest pain. He went to his primary care physician, had an ECG. Long story short, you know, he, he survived it. It wasn't a major heart attack, but clearly it's a life-changing event. One of his vessels was completely occluded. He had a stent to it, and this is relevant to later on in the talk, but there was a bystander disease, we call it moderate narrowing of stenosis of around 57% in his left anterior descending artery. Anything over 70% is considered severe and may be eligible for stenting for symptoms, but certainly not to prevent a heart attack, so that was left alone. But he had his major uh, artery opened up, and his left ventricular function, his heart was still in pretty good shape, there wasn't significant damage, and he gets prescribed the usual cocktail of drugs. Now, I've been obviously a practicing cardiologist for many years, and this is standard practice that we go around in the ER or in the, in the coronary care unit, and we tell patients, take these drugs religiously, they will save your life, and you get put on a cocktail of it, aspirin, another blood thinner for a year, high dose statin, beta blocker, this is a standard practice. So he gets put on these uh, pills, he gets turfed out, um, not really any you know, lifestyle advice to be honest. <laughs> Not surprisingly. And then, just over a year later, he starts to feel not very well. He's gone back to doing exercise. You know, he's starting to, he wants to go back to, you know, running, etc. But he gets all these symptoms. Lack of energy, uh, erectile dysfunction, 
Um, you know, he notices his memory's going a little bit. I mean, you know, all these sorts of different things. Now, because Tony Royal suffered a heart attack, he could no longer go back to flying. That's the rules as an international pilot. But what he did then, what, what he did was go back to his old job before that, which was a maths and physics teacher. So Tony is a, a relatively smart guy. He's very good with statistics. He teaches high school uh, maths and physics. And um, he starts actually looking at the literature on all these drugs that he's taking. He looks at the journal articles on those drugs. He looks at their absolute benefit. He works out, that he, and he thinks that, the side, that he's getting side effects from one of his pills, in particular the statin. So without speaking to his doctor, having looked at the actual benefits, he decides he's going to stop the beta blocker, he's on low dose of that, and the atorvastatin, Lipitor, 80 milligrams, in February 2016. Within weeks, having suffered and felt pretty crappy for quite some time, literally he feels like a new man. He's back to his old self. His symptoms have resolved. Around the same time, he actually starts, you know, he's still overweight, and he starts leading, reading up on, you know, here's about Tim Noakes. He reads some of my work in the newspapers. He starts looking, um, he reads on Gary's work. He starts looking at the whole low-carb uh, diet and thinks, okay, let me give this a go and see what happens. So he decides that he's going to cut out all his starchy carbohydrates, all the sugar. He increases his intake of non-starchy veg, oily fish, eggs, full-fat dairy, nuts, etc., meat. And within three months, he's not changed his exercise level one bit. Within three months, he's lost three stones. Three stones, he's lost eight inches off his waist. Now, his total cholesterol has gone up. Could you convert that? What's a stone? Ah, <laughs> uh, OK, so uh, it's about probably about 20, 18 to 20 kilograms times by 2.2, about 50 pounds. OK, 50 pounds? 15 pounds is a stone. OK, sorry, OK, fine. 14 pounds is a stone, is that right? OK, apologies, OK. Uh, so, um, so he's lost what? Um, 42. 42, OK. I was close. Uh, so he's lost about 42 pounds. And uh, although his total cholesterol has gone up, as many of you know, when you go low carb, for some people, the cholesterol go up, the actual ratio has got better. So his triglycerides have gone down, HDL's gone up. And his total cholesterol to HDL ratio was 5.3, if you remember, before it's gone down to 4.4, within three months. All his metabolic markers are healthy. Now, he's done all of this on his own. He then contacts me and sees me privately. Most of my work is NHS, but I do a bit of occasional private work. And he comes to see me privately. And he walks through the door, and he tells me his story. And in all this time, he's also now looked at all of the drugs he's on. He has made an informed decision to stop all of his pills. So this is a guy who's got a stent, had a heart attack over a year ago. He's off all of his pills. He never felt better in his life. The metal bot markers are great. And I have this conversation with him. He's well informed. No issue. I have no issue with it. But then he goes, Doc, the real reason I came to see you is uh, I wanted to ask whether it's safe for me to do Iron Man now. Okay? Now, a, most cardiologists would be you know, pretty horrified uh, and certainly wouldn't, you know, first of all, he stopped all his pills, but then he's asking about doing Iron Man. And I said to him, I said, listen, you know, you've had a heart attack. There probably is a slightly increased risk of you having not a necessary heart attack, but a, an arrhythmia or something that's going to cause a problem if you go for very high levels of exercise. Um, but if that's what you want to do, then you know, go for it. I would prefer you did less intense exercise, but so he said, OK, I'm going to think about it, Doc. And I also said, listen, consider going back on a low-dose statin, because you may get some benefit and less likely to get side effects. And I'd like to think about going back, back on aspirin again. And he says, OK, I'll think about it. He calls me up two weeks later, and he says, listen, Asim, I've thought about it. I really appreciate the, the consultation. It's been very helpful. But I've decided I'm great as I am. I'm going to keep off the pills and carry on uh, you know, in, in this fashion. OK, we'll, we'll come back. To, so this is a few years ago. We'll come back to Tony, uh, Tony Royal later. So let's just take a step back and let's talk about this issue about cholesterol. So um, cholesterol as a risk factor came from the Framingham Heart Study, which was carried out in Framingham, Massachusetts, started in the 40s and 50s, and went on for several decades. And we, several publications came from Framingham, including high cholesterol being associated with the development of coronary artery disease. But if you look back at that original data, what's very interesting is um, if you look at, so the ideal risk factor should be able to tell you um, what's a normal range that is healthy and not going to give you disease versus a range that's going to give you disease. But from frame, if you look at the top right chart there, um, and there are two kind of, uh, you know, um, those pyramids, if you like, that tell you from Framingham who developed heart disease and who didn't, depending on their cholesterol levels. And what's interesting is only people at the extreme ends was there a, a significant association with heart disease. So if your total cholesterol is essentially over 300, you know, those people, by the way, who interestingly tend to be people who have a genetic condition called familial hyperlipidemia, those are the ones that develop heart disease prematurely. 
And at the other end, with the people of a total cholesterol of less than uh, 150, those people tended not to develop heart disease. Although, interestingly, they didn't <laughs> live any longer than people with higher cholesterol levels. And William Castelli actually concluded specifically about LDL um, from that in, in publishing atherosclerosis in 1996, that unless LDL is over 300, it is essentially useless as a biomarker. Now think about that for a second. We as physicians very rarely see people with LDLs that high. And we are treating people with LDLs much lower and scaring them and telling them they're at high risk. Now, to understand how that happened, the mindset at the time was we should shift the whole population into that low level. The thinking was that if we get the whole population, as many people as possible, to get their total cholesterol levels less than 150, then we will be able to significantly combat heart disease. And it, it was pl it's plausible. It makes sense, doesn't it? But there's a missing um, component to all of this, is that most of our cholesterol is genetic. Individually, about 80% of it is genetic. We can influence a profile, of course, a little bit. But total cholesterol, even LDL, <coughs> most of it is genetic. It's very likely that it, was a gen it wasn't the cholesterol itself, but a genetic association with those levels that were protecting people. But more importantly, we'll come on to what that has done, that whole mindset and the mass prescription of stands cholesterol lowering. Has it actually curbed cardiovascular disease? And I'll come on to that in a second. Um, and what was found actually from Framingham is we use a total cholesterol to HDL ratio. So that's the most important way of measuring risk when you look at cholesterol. And uh, so I was studying all of this over a number of years. And the reason I got involved and interested in all of this is that I was working as a clinical doctor. And I noticed over a period of 10 years since I started my career in 2001, on the coalface, working in the hospitals, I was seeing more and more people with more chronic disease, more stress on the system, more complicated patients. Um, and, and there was more obesity. And I wanted to try and work out and figure out what was going on. How do we stop this problem? And, uh, one of the studies I, I came across, which is very interesting, uh, which was published in Diabetes Care in 2009, revealed that insulin resistance, when they did a modeling study, was the most important risk factor for development of heart disease. And they calculated that if you combated or approached or you know, uh, focused on insulin resistance in people in their 20s and 30s, you would pr prevent 42% of heart attacks. Um, and then after insulin resistance, it was high blood pressure, then it was um, low HDL cholesterol, so-called good cholesterol, then BMI, then LDL. And in fact, the LDL probably is still a significant proportion of people who have familial hyperlipidemia, which affects about 1 in 250 people. The conclusion is interesting. Insulin resistance is likely the most important single cause of coronary artery disease. A better understanding of its pathogenesis and how it might prevent prevented or cured could have a profound effect on coronary artery disease. In other words, they're saying we don't know how to combat insulin resistance. Okay. We know that now, you know, low carb, you know, low refined carbohydrate diet, et cetera, moderate activity, stress reduction, et cetera. But they're saying we don't know how to combat it. And of course, drugs were produced that were trying to combat insulin resistance, didn't really have much of a significant effect. But what's the date on that? The date, this was, Greg, this was 2009. Yeah, 2009. Now, to muddy the waters even further, 2016, I uh, co-authored a paper with, I think you know, Malcolm Kendrick and a number of other authors, um, you know, for international authors, to actually look at what was interesting from framing them as well, which I didn't mention, is that once you hit 50, cholesterol didn't seem to be associated with heart disease. And in fact, as cholesterol dropped, there was an increase in mortality. So that was total cholesterol. And of course, you know cholesterol is made up of HDL, triglycerides, LDL, et cetera. So what we thought we'd do is let's just isolate the so-called bad cholesterol, look at LDL, and see was there any association with coronary artery disease in people over age of 60, and what was that association, how strong was it, et cetera, and how did it link to mortality. And what we found, and we were a bit surprised, actually, there was no association with coronary artery disease if your LDL was high. And in fact, there was an inverse association with all-cause mortality. In other words, the higher LDL if you're over 60, statistically less likely to die. And I remember when we published this, and I did my bit to get it into the news, et cetera, um, and I wrote about this in the Telegraph newspaper. A patient had come to see me, uh, a patient in her early 60s in the NHS. And she walked through the door, and she looked white as a ghost. And I said, what's wrong? And she said, I'm really worried. My doctor, my GP, has said, my cholesterol is very high. I said, congratulations. <laughs> You're gonna, probably going to live longer. And I, I talked her through all of this. And she left the consultation room, and she was reassured, because that was what the evidence was telling us. 
2013 October, so this is for me where the major, major controversy started. Um, you know, I'd been spending a two or three years reading up about the whole issue about saturated fat, cholesterol, um, mass prescription of statins, etc. And I wrote this editorial for the BMJ that was peer reviewed. And in it, I, I tried to really put all of the jigsaw together to explain the obesity epidemic. And I had concluded that our obsession with lowering cholesterol through LDL had led, led to the whole low fat diet, low saturated fat diet movement. And it was clear that we'd increased our consumption of refined carbohydrates. We had this explosion of type 2 diabetes and obesity. But if I was saying that saturated fat was not a major contributor to heart disease, I then also had to justify why cholesterol was not that important, which I've already told you before. And if cholesterol is not that important, then how do statins work? Statins are supposed to save lives. They're supposed to be life-saving drugs, miracle drugs, one of the most prescribed drugs in the history of medicine. So I had to put it all together. And I wrote this editorial. And uh, I was actually not even a full, you know, fully-fledged consultant by that stage. I was a specialist registrar. And the BMJ decided to press release it, which was fine, because at the end of the day, you know, unless this, this gets more attention, then we're not really going to try and change the, the paradigm. And uh, it actually, the timing, et cetera, it became the front page of three British newspapers. I think you know, the Times put butter is back uh, on the front. They were happy. And a cardiologist suddenly saying that you can eat butter again. Um, I was, you know, it, it was a BBC News headline. I was up in front of CNN International, Fox News Chicago. Um, you know, really thrown in front of the kind of headlights. But it was fine. I knew my stuff, and I, was able, I thought I was able to handle it. BMJ were very happy. You know, it got a lot of international attention. And then what happened subsequently uh, was also linked to the fact that in the same issue, and I didn't know this, John Abramson from Harvard, uh, a primary care physician from Harvard, he published in the same issue analysis of whether people at low risk of heart disease would benefit from taking statins. And in it, and the reason he published this paper was there was a move over a number of 20 or 30 years since statins had first come on the market and shown benefit in heart disease patients, more and more people were being prescribed statins because the threshold to prescribe them was getting lower and lower and lower. And what Abramson did was he didn't, you know, he took already published data on statins, which is industry sponsored data, it's not new data, so it's data that's already published, commercially confident, and reanalyzed it to look at in people who have a less than 10%, well, less than 20% risk of heart disease or stroke in the next 10 years, number one, are they going to live any longer? The answer is no. Number two, what are the um, non-mortality benefits in terms of preventing a heart attack? And he determined there was a 1 in 140 chance from an industry-sponsored study, if you took a statin religiously for five years, it would prevent a non-fatal or minor heart attack or a non-disabling stroke. And his conclusion was essentially that, actually, you know what? For this problem with obesity, et cetera, we should be focusing on lifestyle, not statins. That was a hint from the paper. But this is where the controversy happened, which is something that I wrote about as well, is that he said that one in five people taking statins will suffer a significant side effect, certainly a side effect that interferes with the quality of life. And that's what Abramson wrote. And interestingly, by coincidence, I said the same thing in my editorial. We were both citing one community-based study in the United States, which was a very large study. I think it looked at about 100,000 people that reveal that within one year of being prescribed statins, almost 20% of people um, had documentation in the notes from the primary care physician that they stopped their statin. So that was what we essentially both concluded. And actually, I was also reflecting on my own clinical experience, having treated you know, thousands and, of patients, that actually the side effect profile was much higher, certainly from my own clinical experience. So we wrote this in, in, in these papers. Um, and then there was a huge controversy that started that became a big story that is still escalating now. But before I tell you more about that, I just want to tell you about misleading health statistics. So when I talked about the, um, the seven sins that contribute to uh, misinformed doctors and patients, one of them is misleading health statistics, an inability to understand and comprehend very basic statistics. And it's not rocket science. So there are many ways of presenting a benefit, relative risk or something called the NNT, or absolute risk reduction. So if you communicate relative risks as opposed to absolute risks, then it can lead lay people and doctors to overestimate the benefit of medical interventions. So let's take an example of an industry-sponsored study, study on statins uh, in people with type 2 diabetes. So if a type 2 di diabetic patient comes to me and says, should I be taking a statin, I can say to him, well, the trial data says if you take a torvastatin, 10 milligrams, Lipitor, for the next five years religiously, there's a 48% chance you're less like, you know, you're going to have a less chance you're going to have a stroke. That sounds pretty, quite a big number for many people. 
they'll take that, oh, that sounds pretty, pretty big. What does the actual trial data tell us or show us? It tells us that instead of 28 in 1,000 people who are on the placebo suffering a stroke, the ones that took a statin reduced it to 15 in 1,000. So therefore, 13 out of 1,000 people from taking the statin didn't have a stroke because of the statin from a randomized controlled trial, which translates into 1.3% or how I tell my patients when I have this conversation with them, and this is what Tony Royal also understood from his case with heart attack patients, is that in this particular case, you need to treat 77 people to prevent one stroke. So what I say to my patients is, OK, in this conversation, um, there's a 1 in 77 chance based upon this data, which is, again, com commercially confidential. I'll come on to all that in a minute. And if you don't get side effects, there's a 1 in 77 chance that it will prevent you having a stroke. Now, to be honest, most patients, when you tell them that, don't really, not very keen on taking the drug. And I don't coerce them either way. Some of them will say, listen, I'm worried, and I'll take that chance. But this is the ethical way of actually what we should be doing when we prescribe these drugs. Mismatch framing in medical journals has not helped. You know, doctors for many years rely, have relied on medical journals as the biblical truth. It's published in The Lancet, it's published in Nature, it's published in the BMJ, it's published in JAMA. It must be scientifically robust and true, and we should follow what the conclusions of that paper tell us. So if treatment A reduces the risk of disease from 10 to 7 in 1,000, but increases the risk of harm, from 7 to 10 in 1,000, exactly the same. The journal will report the benefit as a relative risk reduction, but the harm as an absolute risk reduction. Okay? So they will say this drug benefits you by 30% relative risk reduction, but the harm is 0.3%. Now, how often is that? So a sample taken looking at JAMA, BMJ, and The Lancet between 2004 and 2006 found that one third of all articles, surprise, surprise, drug, drug industry sponsored research, use mismatch framing. So you can imagine, even the doctors are exaggerating their own minds the benefit of a drug and minimizing the harms. Don't just take my word for it in terms of ethical practice. This is a, a bulletin from the man who's considered the world leading research on health literacy in the Max Planck Institute in Berlin, Gerd Gigerenza. In a World Health Organization bulletin, you can Google this, it's free open access. He said it is an ethical imperative that every um, patient understand the difference between absolute and relative risks to protect patients against unnecessary anxiety and manipulation. In other words, and I would argue that us as a medical profession, by not telling patients in these absolute terms, and data says it can, you can work it out, then we are actually not being ethical. This is non-transparent communication of risk. Remember the evidence-based medicine triad about patient values and preferences. This is something that is so important that we are not doing routinely. Right, let's come back to the statin controversy now. So BMJ published this article for me and Abrams in 2014, uh, 13 October. Great news headlines, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what was happening behind the scenes is the lead researcher on statins in the world, Professor Sir Rory Collins of Oxford, who got his knighthood from his work on statins, uh, probably the, yeah, the lead researcher in the world on this, who is a co-director of the Oxford Clinical Trial Service Unit, who's all, whose department has received well, in, two, well in, in excess of 200 million pounds from drug companies that, that manufacture statins over the years. He wasn't very happy with our articles. And he said that we specifically, he didn't challenge about the, lack, the benefit issue. He said that we've exaggerated the side effects. This will cause considerable harm because of the publicity that went around it. And that um, it's, you know, this will cause many, this will result in many deaths from people at high risk, people with heart attacks, people like Tony Royal, for example, stopping their statins and lots of people will die. And he wrote an, uh, a, uh, an email to the editor of the BMJ, Fiona Godley, and said, you need to retract these articles. She said, why would I retract them? We will publish a rebuttal from you. He didn't want to do that. He said, no, retract, retract, retract. This went back and forth. She said, no. He then goes to the Guardian newspaper, and he basically, this became a front page story. I got a phone call from the BBC and the Guardian in March saying that you, are, you and John Abramson are basically being accused of murder, essentially. Um, and uh, how do you, because there are errors, You're, you know, you've made a major error by saying one in five people taking statins suffer significant side effects. This is not in keeping with Professor Collins's data, you know, eminence from Oxford. Um, you know, how do you respond to this? So he started this, uh, and what happened at the end of this um, media publicity, and this is what Collins said, by the way, he said one in 10,000 people gets significant side effects. This is quoted in the Guardian newspaper. This is what he said. Now, we were essentially then on trial. The BMJ editor, I think, did the right thing. She said, okay, 
I'm biased in this. I'm going to send these articles for an independent review for calls for retraction. They went for independent review. I think there was, I think John Ioannidis actually was on the panel as well uh, in reviewing this. And they came back unanimous saying there was absolutely six people on the panel saying there was no cause for retraction, but we should put a correction or caveat and saying that the citation that we used about side effects was not from a randomized trial. It was real world. And that was essentially, you know, that was what we, what we did. And that, that correction was put in. I then decided at this stage, I think there was an element of trying to scare us from you know, being outspoken about this. I said, this is a distraction. This is all about transpa transparent communication of risk. I then started getting invited editorials from various journals. I started writing stuff and kept pushing this message it was very di with many different people, many different respected scientists who were on my side and said, yes, we need to just make sure that patients know exactly what benefit they're getting, but also let's emphasize lifestyle. So I kept writing stuff and getting stuff in the news. So this kept going on now after, this, uh, after we were exonerated. And then what happens is Rory Collins comes out because of all this media publicity and says, okay, we're gonna reanalyze our own data in, in Oxford and tell you what the true side effects are. Which I thought was a bit strange because you know, there's commercially confidential information that they will not release the raw data for independent analysis, but we're gonna analyze it ourselves. And then another big news story happens in uh, September 2016, where The Lancet published a paper saying, you know, 27 authors, Rory Collins, the lead author, statins, statins are fine, side effects are rare, we, let's just put this to bed, end of story, let's not discuss it anymore, essentially. They wanted to close down the debate. And uh, I was actually over um, at a conference in the States, I was in Arizona, about two weeks later, I was asked to comment for BBC News, and I said, well, again, this, doesn't, this isn't really in keeping with, our, with clinical experience, and actually, these guys should have released the raw data. Why are they not releasing their raw data for independent analysis so people can actually really find out how those trials were conducted, and why is it there is a huge discrepancy between the real-world data, where, by the way, up to 50% of people will stop taking a statin within a couple of years of prescription, even heart attack patients. So when you ask patients why, they say they got side effects, okay? I get a phone call from the uh, chief uh, investigative reporter of the Sunday Times newspaper. I'm in Arizona at a conference, and he says, I see his name's John, I'm friendly with him. He said, I see you won't believe this. I said, what? He says, guess what I found out? And this is actually an excerpt from the Sunday Times newspaper in September 2016, after Professor Collins had published in the Lancet saying side effects are, whatever, one in 100 at maximum. So Rory Collins, professor of medicine, epidemiology, Oxford, led a review in statins published in The Lancet earlier this month, which found not more than one in 50 people will suffer side effects. Said, so, you know, very rare and reversible fine. Collins, who believes millions more Britons could benefit by taking statins, is also co-inventor of a test <laughs> that indicates susceptibility to muscle pain from them. That test, branded as Statin Smart, is sold online in the United States for $99 on a website that claims 29% of all statin users will suffer muscle pain, weakness, or cramps. The marketing material also claims that 58% of patients on statin stop, that's true, taking them within a year, but mostly because of muscle pain. <laughs> Royalties from licensing of the patent can be used to fund university research, but Collins had denied any personal fees. And Boston, this is interesting, so Boston Heart Diagnostics, who had the license for this, they stood by their claims and they said that they cited a US task force on statin safety that said that randomized control trials such as those used in the Lancet study led by Collins had major limitations because patients with statin intolerance were often excluded. I then, um, John then actually did a freedom of information request. So did they make any money out of selling this? Because it's all very bizarre, it's very puzzling, I think. Um, and basically they found that Oxford received about 300,000 um, pounds Professor Collins' department, all very puzzling. and can't quite figure out what's going on there. Now, have statins actually reduced cardiovascular mortality in the population? Now, this paper in the BMJ looked at increase in statin utilization across different risk groups, low risk and high risk. And interestingly, they found no reduction in cardiovascular mortality from taking statins over 12 years across several European countries. Now, how can you explain that scientifically? Let's say there is, I'm not suggesting there is fraud. I do think that, um, you know, to play devil's advocate, I think these randomized trials and the drug companies very specifically wanted to show statins worked. And when they figured out which patients are likely to get side effects, they just were not enrolled in those trials. And then they, you're basically making conclusions on very selected people, but those conclusions then drive guidelines around the world. 
And th I think this is a major problem. This is why there is a huge discrepancy on statins. But let's just think about their absolute benefits. Now, if you look at the statistics differently and don't look at the NNT1 in so, so many people benefiting, you can look at the statistics differently and work out, on average, how much longer are people going to live from taking statins. Let's just take the heart attack patients, the high-risk patients, okay, people like Tony Royal. If you've had a heart attack and you take a statin religiously, I'm sure many of you probably know the answer to this anyway, because I've written about it, and I'm sure you've read Malcolm's work as well. But if you take a statin religiously for five years, um, you know, how much longer are people expected to live if they take a statin and they don't get side effects and have had a heart attack? And the answer is just over four days. <laughs> okay? And this is based upon, this is still based upon industry-sponsored selected trials. Now, if 50% of patients in the real world are stopping their statin, even people with heart disease within a couple of years, you can scientifically explain why there is no reduction in mortality in the population or reduction in cardiovascular mortality. So this has been our biggest weapon in the fight against heart disease for the last several decades. And it has still failed. There is good evidence, there's a good argument to show that it has failed to reduce population cardiovascular mortality. We talked about best available evidence. Another thing that's interesting when it comes to cholesterol lowering, there's been, this was published in, the, in BMJ Evidence-Based Medicine a couple of years ago, a really good editorial. And it showed that almost four dozen randomized control trials, some of them involving statin trials, some of them on new lower cholesterol and lower drugs, showed absolutely no mortality benefit. Most of them had no reduction in heart attacks, and some showed harm. So this is the evidence that's being ignored in our approach to cholesterol lowering across the population. I personally really don't care about lowering cholesterol. I care about insulin resistance, and the cholesterol profile may get better, and that's great. But I do not have that approach. My colleague um, who's at UCSF, Professor Rita Redberg, editor of Jarmatone Medicine, we've had conversations about this. She even thinks, it seems she's been public about it, we should actually even probably stop even measuring cholesterol, okay? Because it is a very poor surrogate for your risk of cardiovascular disease. So what are the unintended consequences of this whole focus, myopic focus on LDL going back, you know, several decades, is that we have now prescribed statin to lots of people at low risk of heart disease, okay? Statin users, there's something called statin gluttony. Many patients actually think they can eat what they want because they're on a statin and their cholesterol's been lowered, even though it's not going to benefit them. We know statins now increase the risk of type 2 diabetes. About 1 in 50 to 1 in 100 people will get type 2 diabetes just because of the statin. And of course, the whole low-fat, high-sugar, high-carbohydrate food that's come on the back of this so-called you know, uh, science which has evolved um, has you know, contributed, in my view, uh, is a root cause for type 2 diabetes and obesity. And of course, m you know, more importantly as well, it's distracted us from more important measures or ways of tackling coronary artery disease. This is what we're facing now. This, is, uh, you know, this slide, uh, it's the, the figures are very similar in the United States, that we've got this huge problem with uh, people being overweight or obese. Uh, and more worryingly, one in three children by the time they leave primary school by the age of 11 are in the same category. And the trends are still increasing. They have not plateaued or, or reduced. Um, and you know, the food environment, you know, we talk about the, you know, the wider determinants of health is to blame. It's at the root cause because these sorts of highly processed or, you know, carbohydrate, um, processed carbohydrate, sugary foods are everywhere. And for me as well, when I started my campaign, one of the things I started doing was saying that actually we as doctors should set the right example because even our hospitals have become a branding opportunity for the junk food industry, which is absolutely crazy. You know, how can we talk about tackling this problem when we ourselves are basically selling junk food in the hospital grounds? And, you know, um, there are one point, the largest employer in the UK is the NHS, 1.4 million employees. 50% of doctors and nurses are now overweight or obese. And it's not surprising when the food, it's not about education, it's about the food environment. You know, education, of course, is important, but the bigger driver of our food behavior is our food environment. And of course, you know, this picture speaks a thousand words. This does not help. Now, some people will contest this, but you know, in the modern, so the biggest decline in cardiovascular disease deaths over the last few decades, most of it can be attributed to smoking reduction. About 50% of it can be from smoking reduction, and it wasn't education, it was more about policies that public smoking bans, <coughs> raising the price of cigarettes, et cetera. Those were the, the, the big uh, winners. But when it comes to chronic disease and death now, poor diet appears to be more responsible for chronic disease and death and physical inactivity, alcohol and smoking combined. 
And this is Tom Friedman's Health Impact Pyramid, which basically just puts things in context that if we're looking at the bigger picture about how we're going to help improve population health, we need to really make the context of the food environment better because that has a much bigger impact on population health than counseling or education. And of course, socioeconomic factors, of course. Poverty, poor housing, these have a much bigger effect than anything else on people's health. And the reason for um, you know, having these population public policy type strategies are more effective because they will be, reach all parts of the population and are not being dependent on a sustained individual response. Now, one of the debates going on at the moment about low carb versus low fat versus veganism, et cetera, et cetera, is about sustainability, people falling off the wagon. My, you know, you can do it for so long and many people are able to sustain it, but many people aren't. And I think one of the reasons of lack of sustainability is that you're constantly still combating this food environment, which is high in sugary and processed foods. And I think it makes it more difficult, more challenging. Some people are more strong-willed and can do it and other people can't, but it is a big factor on why you know, I think this approach on education alone will be ineffective in the longer <coughs> term. And that means in terms of changing even the dietary guidelines. Okay, so um, we've not got that much time left, so I will uh, just talk a little bit about sugar. So I've been an advocate of sugar. My, my guru, my mentor on sugar is here today, Robert Lustig. Um, he published a paper in Nature. That got me really interested in sugar. I started investigating it myself. And I, one thing I just wanted to work out, and having looked at the research, I think 2009, the American Heart Association had actually said, and Robert's obviously one of the co-authors here, I wanted to work out, once I'd realized sugar was harmful, the question is, how much sugar is harmful after what threshold? And the AHA, with Robert's help, had basically determined that six teaspoons for, the, for an adult uh, was the maximum limit. It's now become six teaspoons for average adult. Um, and the average American citizen, <coughs> interestingly, was consuming at least about 22 teaspoons a day. So more than three times what the limit is, was recommended, after which you have adverse consequences of metabolic health. Now in Europe, I'm going to show you this Coca-Cola can, and this still exists, so this is pretty extraordinary. So I did my own investigation here, and I wanted to look at what were people being told about sugar when they're going to the supermarket, how much should you be consuming? And the labeling here, it's a bit blurry, says that in this can of Coca-Cola, um, 35 grams, it contains 35 grams, this is a 330 mil, uh, a third of a liter, I don't know what units you use here, but um, can, this shows, uh, 35 grams, of this is 36%, th sorry, 39% of your guideline daily amount. This is across the whole of Europe. In other words, it's telling you, if you calculate, this is about eight and a half to nine teaspoons of sugar in here, that you should be consuming 22 teaspoons of sugar a day, not a limit. And this had been going on for several years, of well over a decade. So I tried to investigate how did this all happen. And I went to the root of it, and I basically discovered that the food industry had had an influence on these guidelines, surprise, surprise, um, in particular the sugar industry. Um, and you know, I wrote, I wrote an editorial in the BMJ just about the whole issue about obesity. I mean, up to a few years ago, for many people, they thought and believed that it was all about lack of activity. It didn't matter what you eat. As long as you exercise, you can burn it off, et cetera, et cetera. But you can't outrun your, outrun your fork or you can't outrun a bad diet, as me and Tim Noakes have written about. And I looked at what had the food industry been doing to, to try and hinder any progress in terms of curbing their excesses and manipulations. And of course, they were following the corporate playbook of big tobacco in many ways, which was basically uh, planting doubt that cigarettes were harmful or planting doubt that junk food is harmful, denial, confusing the public, and even buying the loyalty of scientists. You know, whatever it takes to protect their interests of profit. And just to give you an example of the level of denialism, denialism, the CEOs of every major tobacco firm as late as 1994 went in front of US Congress and swore under oath they did not believe nicotine was addictive or smoking caused lung cancer. That's the extent of the denialism. So I wrote about this in the BMJ. This is before the, the saturated fat piece and this whole investigation saying we need to actually tackle sugar now. This is a big problem. And look at this issue about the labeling, which is very misleading. Um, and I went on BBC Breakfast prime time. And it was interesting that you know, I explained all of this stuff around sugar and we should be limiting it and all the labeling being wrong. And it was interesting at the end, uh, the presenter said we should ask, we did ask 10 different companies, organizations associated with these uh, you know, sugar essentially supermarkets, et cetera, to discuss with Dr. Malhotra. All of them were unavailable, <laughs> simple. After this, I got contacted by several scientists and said, listen, we read your article. We think this is a really important issue. Some very eminent people actually in the UK um, and said, let's form a group called Action on Sugar. Let's go for it. Let's really highlight this problem. Let's talk about policy change. Let's highlight all of the corruption in the system, et cetera, really linked to sugar. We formed Action on Sugar. And uh, I remember I was, I was over in the States. I was visiting my cousin here in Mountain View. Um, and we were planning the launch in January in the new year in 2000 and, um, uh, 2014. 
and uh, and it was basically uh, you know I wrote this press release and again this was it was huge in in the UK you may have heard it over here but when a right a relatively right wing newspaper and the government in power at the moment at that time was a Conservative Party which is you know a relatively right wing government when they put on their front page sugar is a new tobacco I knew that we were onto a winner here I mean this was huge I mean. Up to that point, there was a build-up. There were articles, more and more people writing about sugar, but suddenly 16 you know, eminent scientists in the UK suddenly say this is a big problem. Um, and it went, you know, it went viral. I mean, it was, you know, it was a, big, uh, a big event. Within a couple of days, you know, we'd actually called on politicians now to do something about this, to curb sugar, calling for sugary drinks, taxes, and all that kind of stuff. Um, within a few days, though, the former Secretary State for Health, Andrew Lansley, who people, some people describe as the chief destroyer of the National Health Service by starting privatization going. He got up in Parliament and he said, well, in fact, before he, before he got up, um, on the opposition side, there is a guy called Keith Vaz, who is a chair of the old party diabetes group. He supported us and he got about 40 signatures from MPs, members of Parliament across the whole of uh, Parliament to support our, uh, you know, our action on sugar, essentially. And Andrew Lansley gets up and he gets up in Parliament and he speaks and he says basically that this analogy between sugar and tobacco was not appropriate. Sugar is essential to food. He actually said that. <laughs> sugar is essential to food. So the editor, common editor of the Observer newspaper calls me up and said, Asim, what do you think of all this? By the way, great work, et cetera. Do you want to write a commentary? You know, we'll, we'll go really big with it. I said, great. So I basically called that Lansley. Now, Sugar's New Tobacco, interesting, was Robert Lustig's original. Um, he'd said that, I think, the first person to say it. But Simon Capel, one of our experts, had said it as well in the press release. And obviously, the media loved that. Um, and I basically wrote this in The Observer. And I said that um, uh, Lansley attempted to rubbish respected public health expert Simon Capel's statement that Sugar's New Tobacco. Lansley then compounded his errors by ignorantly asserting the House that sugar is essential to food. It is not. He would have been more accurate in saying sugar is essential to food industry profits and lining the pockets of his co-opted partners. Lansley was a paid director to marketing company Prefero at the end of 2009. Prefero's clients have included Pepsi, Mars, Pizza Hut, and D.H.O.'s Guinness. We didn't hear from Andrew Lansley again. Sunlight is a very powerful disinfectant. And then the following week, we find out that several members of the Scientific Advisory Committee on Nutrition, there was an investigation going on by Channel 4 News and dispatches, that they also were taking money from sugar industry, et cetera, and were basically being put in the spotlight saying, why have you had this guidance for so long? You need to change your guidance. It's not in keeping with the evidence. We should be combating sugar. And of course, then what happened is, I think because of a lot of media pressure, really, um, and this was pretty extraordinary. We got invited to meet the Secretary of State for Health at that time, who was um, Jeremy Hunt. And he said, listen, OK, give us your child obesity plan. Because, of course, children are the most vulnerable in, in this situation. And we said we need to bring a sugar drinks tax. And a year later, you know, we, we get sugar drinks tax introduced in the UK, which is fantastic. But you know, quite surprising from the type of government that was in power at the time. Now, um, I think uh, I've got a few more minutes left. OK, let's move forward. So in all of this, I've carried on with my kind of private advocacy. And I thought, listen, this saturated fat message was still a problem. What could I do to try and get greater reach, um, certainly greater acceptance amongst my peers and colleagues that we should not be focusing on saturated fat to be the primary focus of curbing cardiovascular disease, and also accept the new paradigm that it should be insulin resistance and chronic inflammation, which the data is pretty strong on, that this is actually linked to those two uh, conditions. So Rita Redberg and Pascal Meyer are both editors of medical journals. They're both practicing cardiologists. And I contacted them and said, listen, why don't we write this editorial for the British Journal of Sports Medicine? Of course, it went through peer review, et cetera. You know, and and uh, we published it, and it got a lot of attention. I was glad about that. And, and this is a simplistic, but I think an important diagram, just to try and explain that really, you know, if you want to combat heart disease, my personal interpretation of all the evidence is that it's a, a low refined carbohydrate diet. I think there are certain components of the Mediterranean diet are beneficial whether it's anti-inflammatory, whether it's good for the gut microbiome, but certainly something that is nutrient dense and doesn't promote insulin resistance. So my own interpretation is that you know, this is what we should be following, or certainly one of the, the best diets you can follow. And of course, combined with activity, stress reduction, et cetera, and smoking cessation. And if we do that, we'll also combat about 50% of hypertension and, as, and prevent type 2 diabetes as well as combating heart disease. So I wrote this book, and it's not to promote the book. I wrote the book for policy change. But basically, I wrote this book to try and change policy and, and change dietary guidance, et cetera, called The Piopi Diet. And again, I, you know, I knew there was going to be a backlash. So I got some people who are very eminent people, including the mayor of Manchester, 
uh, former Secretary for Health, the most important doctor in the UK to basically endorse and say every household medical student doctor should have this book. And I was going for it. I mean, I was saying cholesterol isn't that important, saturated fat, et cetera. I didn't talk about statins in this book. That'll come in the next one. Um, but yeah, this is what I did just because I knew when this book comes out, there's probably going to be a backlash and let me arm myself with as many people as possible in this, uh, in this movement who are going to have an impact. An influence, um, and you know, uh, Andy Burnham, mayor of Manchester, you know, he he endorsed it. Um, Sarah Cox is a well-known broadcaster, BBC broadcaster. She, I don't know her. She heard me on a radio station, and you know, she said she lost her muffin top, eight pounds of her muffin top from going low carb, and she was very happy about that. Uh, and uh, and this was probably the most interesting one. Tom Watson was a deputy leader of the Labour Party. Uh, opposition party, and he had always been known as being extremely overweight. He contacted me on Twitter um, six months after the book was published. Said, "It seemed, listen, I've tried every diet under the sun, but this low carb diet actually for me is doing. Re I'm doing really well." And then within a year, he lost 100 pounds, and he was able to reverse his type 2 diabetes. And then he obviously came out and said that this had helped him as well. Um, this is just uh, the book got released in Holland. Um, a little bit of self-indulgence here, of course. But you know, we've got Piopi Dyke number one, Stephen Hawking books number two there. Uh, <laughs> but but the reason I put this slide up is um, they, they did an experiment. N equals three. I got called by this uh, documentary filmmaking um, uh, health program in, in Holland to say, listen, we've heard about your book. We want to put three people with type two obesity, etc., on your diet. You claim that you can reverse type two diabetes in 28 days. In fact, I even said 21 days. We want to try it on these people. And luck would have it, the chap with type 2 diabetes for 15 years was about to go on insulin within 28 days. And they're getting their results live on camera, having done this experiment. And they're really emotional about it, as you know when this happens. People obviously get very emotional and patients get better. Um, and then it got to number one for about six weeks until the Dutch Nutrition Council came in and said, Dr. Malhotra is telling people to eat 15 eggs a week. That's dangerous. Um, so it got, put, it got knocked off the top there. But at least we had a little bit of glory for a while. Um, now, uh, Gary mentioned my Wikipedia page. Uh, this is all the stuff that I have, and many of us here have had to deal with behind the scenes. I've had, I don't talk about it now, but I've had so many attacks on my career. I've had to change jobs a few times. When I wrote the saturated fat piece, I got called up in front of the medical director of the hospital and says, do you know your duties as a doctor, et cetera? How can we tell, are you telling us that our cardiac nurses should tell our heart patients to eat butter instead of margarine? Yes. Um, so all of this stuff was going on, but Public Health England got very worried about the book. Uh, and Tom Watson's promotion of it. And um, they basically tried to stop me speaking at my local hospital, the chief executive, you know, government agency, essentially. So this was the Sunday Times ended this story, which was good just to expose this is what was going on. Tom Watson supported me. And the reason they were angry with me was because I was saying we need to really cut out the amount of starch and sugar we're, we're consuming. Now, this is the NHS England's uh, Eat Well Guide, OK? Not terrible, but there's quite a lot of starch, as you can see there. The thing that I have, the, the biggest issue I have here is if you look here in, the, in the, the bottom left corner, they've got junk food on there, right? This is supposed to be the health eating guide. They just put it on there. They've got cakes, they've got candy, they've got whatever. And they say eat less often and in small amounts. Now, why is this even on there? Why is it on there? Now, Zoe Harkham, as you know, you know, she wrote an editorial in British Journal of Sports Medicine and found out that the people involved in designing the World Guide, most of them had links to various companies that profit from selling these products. And it's not a coincidence. Now, I'm not going to name this person, but I bumped into this in the street uh, a few months ago with one of the most senior people involved in these nutrition guidelines. Okay? I won't name this person for obvious reasons. And I spoke to him or her, and I said, why have you got, listen, let's, there are all these diet wars going on. I think all of us can agree that ultra-processed food is a problem. Okay? If we agree that ultra-processed food is a problem, whether you're vegan or whether you're a carnivore or whether you're, you're low-carb or whether you're, you know, Low, low fat, why have you got the, these foods on there? And her, his or her reaction <laughs> to me was a seam. You've got, and I was pretty shocked, actually. By the way, remember the seven Nolan principles. You've got to understand one of the biggest contributors to the GDP of our economy is the food industry. This is someone who you, we would trust to be giving us independent advice. But said it in such a sanguine, blasé way that, in my view, obviously, you know, um, I think that, you know, that these people perhaps have crossed the line a, a long time ago. Um, another problem we have is lobbying on politicians, and all of this is linked. Uh, the BMJ published uh, something uh, uh, earlier um, uh, this year showing that 
uh, a think tank, a free market think tank called the Institute of Economic Affairs, had given about £4.3 million to the Conservative Party since 2002, and specifically were lobbying against public health interventions, such as sugary drinks taxes, banning on junk food advertising, etc. And I think that's a big problem. I wrote this other article. Once we'd got the sugary drinks tax, myself and Robert Lustig um, and Grant Schofield from, from New Zealand basically wrote a very long paper essentially putting the, about the science of sugar but saying we actually need to extend it to all sugary foods now as well. Um, it's not just the sodas, it's a problem about all the ultra-processed foods and all the sugar in them. Um, but we, just, we did mention the IEA and said that they'd undisclosed voluntary donations from a number of organizations including Big American Tobacco, Coca-Cola uh, and Tate and & Lyle. Uh, and the more lobbyists tried to hijack the think tank label in an attempt to mask their pay-for spin as research-driven advocacy, the more important it becomes for the think tank sector as a whole to fight back. The best weapon in that fight is transparency. About to finish. So um, Simon Chapman is considered probably one of the most influential figures in Australia, in fact, the most influential figure in Australia in curbing and bringing down uh, consumption of tobacco and taking on the tobacco industry. And he wrote this really great paper, which when I read, I kind of, I, it resonated with me. A lot of it already resonated with me as if I'd read it before, but I hadn't. And he talks about his 38-year career, about how you really make change happen on a public health level. Um, and he talks about different things, about use of the media being very important. Because ultimately, for me and for many of us here, I'm sure, you know, this is what's going on right now in modern healthcare, whether it's the food industry or the pharmaceutical industry, is a gross injustice. It's a gross injustice uh, on, on the public, on our relatives, on our friends, on our families, you know, because people are being misled uh, and deliberately misled for profit. If there's a gross injustice going on, if you want to revolutionize things, what do you do? You make the injustice visible. That's what you do. And the, and the best way to do that, the ideal platform is mass media. And when mass media get behind it and you commit to media, everything changes. But one of the things he writes about is if you're going to do this, you must grow a rhinoceros hide. He says, because unless you're an advocate for an utterly uncontroversial policy, as soon as your work threatens an industry or ideological cabal, you will be attacked, sometimes unrelentingly and viciously. And I and a number of people, I was front and center of this Guardian article being called a cholesterol denier. Now, everything I've said to you today, I've not said anything different in the past. You may think, God, this guy's a cholesterol denier, a stat denier. No, I'm talking about transparency. But this is what they want to do. They want to label us as, you know, these kind of, you know, spreading misinformation, causing harm, etc. And then, more recently, myself, Malcolm Kendrick, and Zoe Harkham, in a front page linked article in the Mail on Sunday, were accused of spreading basically deadly propaganda. And the editor, the health editor, there is a special place in hell for the doctors who claim statins don't work. I've never said they don't work. I've just said this is what their benefit is, and this is about ethical practice. Um, and what was interesting about this, though, which is quite amusing, the reason this article, this story, got on the front page of the Mail on Sunday is they managed to get the then Secretary of State for Health, Matt Hancock, to say there is no room for people like this in our National Health Service. Now, I had met Matt Hancock a few days earlier in Parliament before I spoke about type 2 diabetes. And I messaged Matt, and I said, Matt, did you know this, your statement that's now made a front page story calling these people like me, you know, no praise in the NHS? He said, I see him, I had no idea this was linked to you. This is how the journalists had used a politician with whatever lobbying was going on in the background to create this story. So then the I newspaper, where I hit back, and in fact, I got the editor of the BMJ even to call for retraction of the Guardian article and calling the cholesterol. It was completely misleading, lots of uh, errors and defamatory statements about us. Um, and I got the editor of the BMJ to come in as well and to say that even this Guardian article should be corrected. You know. um, the problem we've got is we've got a lot of eminence-based medicine at the moment. So the Lancet recently published something, uh, one of Professor Collins' colleagues, Colin Bajant, which became a big news headline saying over 75s taking statins will save 8,000 lives a year. The only problem was, which became the headline from Colin Bajant, who was the lead author, the only problem was his own paper didn't say that. His own paper didn't reveal that there was no mortality benefit. No one's, no, if you're over 75 taking a statin at low risk, you're not going to live longer. He basically made it up. But that, you know, what, what Winston Churchill's saying, a lie can travel halfway around the world before the truth has got a chance to put its boots on. What's going on here? I'm confused. Um, and what's interesting, so when you actually look at data and evidence, when you tell patients transparently about their risk and benefit at low risk and high risk, the overwhelming majority of patients 
would choose not to take a statin. Now, it's estimated about 100 million people globally are prescribed statins. Most of these people are low risk. And the data tells us if you actually told them the truth, forget about side effects, by the way, not even mentioning side effects, just about the small benefit, most of them would not take the statin. And then, uh, you know, because of all this back and forth, I thought, okay, well, you know, let's, let's take this further. Let's get a parliamentary inquiry. So this has been instigated. Uh, I've, I'm, I'm working on that. I got Rita Redberg, Fiona Godley, a number of, of doctors, eminent people, to sign a letter saying that we need actually a full parliamentary inquiry now into statins. So that, uh, the ball has started rolling. Whether it happens or not is difficult to say. We've now got a new government in power um, who've got an even larger majority than they had before, which is obviously very worrying from a public health perspective um, because they are considered very right wing. So uh, I don't know whether it's going to happen in the next few years, but this, this is not going to go away. So let's finish. Um, when you actually tell patients the full information about whether it's a surgical procedure or a drug, most of them choose less treatment. So they choose less treatment, you save money, you can use that in better areas and redirect it, you can talk about lifestyle. And I wrote this uh, in the Pharmaceutical Journal with um, Professor Dame Sue Bailey, who is a former chair of the Medical Royal Colleges. And actually, we say that it's just a very simple evidence-based medicine practice. If we practice that, all of us adhere to it, we can actually um, improve people's health significantly. Now, something very personal to me um, that I, uh, I wrote about uh, uh, and published about 10 days ago. So just over a year ago, I lost my mother. And uh, in the most horrible circumstances. My mother died at the age of 68. Um, you know, my father is a doctor, and she had, you know, bad luck, ultra-processed food, vegetarian diet, all these things contributed. But what happened when she eventually got into hospital was the worst part. Because the system is failing so badly, because we have a lack of funding into our National Health Service, because the chronic disease is increasing. And I personally predicted this as a cardiology registrar 10 years ago when I was working on the coronary care unit. And I was seeing all these people getting sick or more sick and less staff. You know, there was very little slack left in the system. And when my mother got admitted, um, they missed a heart attack for 11 days because they were too busy. We knew the doctors. We, this is our local hospital. They missed a heart attack. She got breathless, they didn't realize it was a heart attack, and then a heart scan picked it up, which was not reported on for 11 days because they were so busy. She then went into something called crashing pulmonary edema, heart failure. My dad was up with her, I was going back and forth. And because the doctor was too busy on a weekday, seeing some of the other patients for two hours, she was essentially drowning in pulmonary edema. This is something that should be treated within minutes and can make somebody comfortable. Um, and you know, in my attempt, you know, I, I, it took me a while to write this article, and it was very difficult for me to write it. But I wrote it, and I sent it to the eye, and they said, listen, we, we, you know, we're going to go with this as a front page. And this is actually two days before the general election. I was hoping it would have some impact, hopefully, because this particular government that's here at the moment has specifically, deliberately, in my view, reduced the resources and funding to the National Health Service because uh, many people believe they actually want to privatize the health service. So I wrote this article, and you know, it's, this is the, I have personally now experienced the end result of our failure to really tackle, tackle these system failures. But there is a message of hope, and the message of hope is people like Tony Royal, who several years later, you know, we wrote this editorial and we talked about the fact that you know, he, um, he did do his Iron Man. In fact, he, he, he messages me all the time. He's breaking his own records now. Um, he, I think he came 17th in the world in the World Amateur Iron Man Championship, something like that. And this is an amazing story. He's almost 60. He's had a heart attack several years ago. He's not on any pills. Everything from him has been about lifestyle, and in fact now, his, um, this is three years of all pills. His cholesterol profile is actually beautiful. Total cholesterol to HDL ratio is 3.25. He's still low carb, sometimes keto, sometimes low carb. Um, his performance is better than it's ever been. Um, and uh, I'll just finish with one final slide. I think you know, we, we can solve these problems together, but we have to speak up. Um, we can't stay silent any longer uh, because you know, so many people are suffering. And we're all ultimately affected by it. Uh, and one of my inspirations is Mahatma Gandhi, and he one of his quotes is, science becomes cowardice when occasion demands speaking out the whole truth and acting accordingly. So let's be brave. Thank you very much.